From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to The Hub. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. It's about the economy. China's leadership recently convened this all-important Central Economic Work Conference in Beijing. And in it, senior decision makers say China's economy is recovering against the backdrop of structural reform. What are the key takeaways from this very important annual gathering of China's top economic policymakers and decision makers? What are the so-called hard truths? And how will they impact the trajectory of the Chinese economy going forward? Now, to take stock of all these important questions and to take a look at the Chinese economy, I'm pleased to be joined by Liu Baocheng in our studio. He's the Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of the International Business and Economics. I'm also joined by Jill Stajan in Shanghai. He's the Director of Business Operations at the African Chamber of Commerce in China. And also in Beijing, we have Andy Mock, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome, gentlemen. Let me start with you, Andy. There are so many ways to look at these um, uh, important messages from this all-important economic conference of China. Um, what's your rating of it? What messages did you pick up? Well, thanks for having me on, Wang Guan. So I think I had two important takeaways uh, from this meeting. The first is that it's a validation that China's long-term economic strategy is largely correct. And the decision uh, from the work conference is stay the course uh, with some minor modifications. The second is that the call to adhere to high quality development as the hard truth for the new era. And this makes me think of an American uh, business self-help book that was called What Got You Here Won't Get You There, yeah, yeah. How Successful People Become More Successful, and that there are new realities uh, that China has recognized and is adapting to that perhaps we'll have more time to explore later. No, no, explain to us. I mean, that was a fascinating book. Um, I think that was issued more than, uh, that was published more than 10 years ago. Um, a fascinating title and maybe yes. even more fascinating content. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when we look at what got China to where it is today, so from 1978 to 2023, we're looking at 45 years of economic reform. It's been nothing short of an economic miracle, and it relied on a low-cost workforce, uh, attracting foreign investment, and access uh, to certain foreign markets. So this is what got China here. Going forward, uh, we can see that uh, China is much closer to the frontier of uh, advanced technology. So uh, it really has to emphasize R&D, commercialization of technology, versus looking to others for technology. We also see uh, a more complex geopolitical environment with conflicts in Europe, with Ukraine, uh, conflicts in the Middle East, uh, that this really makes the uh, world a more dangerous and complex place. And we also see new partnerships emerging, say, with Russia, uh, which is on track to do something like, what, $200 billion, uh, in bilateral trade with China. So uh, what is going to get China to the next stage of success will not be what got it to its current stage of success. So I think this is the hard truth that uh, the government is confronting. Right, right. Thank you for um, uh, you know in putting light on all these important issues. Uh, Jills, um, how do you look yes. at the important decisions, uh, assessments coming out of this important uh, work conference of China, which will hopefully um, set the tone for the Chinese economy going into the next year? Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I, I had the same assessment as the, 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 the talking previous, um, before me. Basically, we have the sense that um, the government, the central government, try to uh, stay the course. I mean, they want to make sure that the Chinese economy is robust because we are entering a very uh, fragile environment. And uh, what we can get from that meeting was how to make sure that the Chinese economy is strong enough to face the challenges that are coming. 
we can see from Europe, the European Union policies when it comes to China that we have a very antagonistic approach when it comes to uh, all the policy regarding the de-risking or the decoupling or even when you uh, just look at the media, the way China is perceived in Europe has shifted now. And this is also hurting uh, China when it comes to exports. We have seen a sharp decline uh, when it comes to exports from China to Europe, from China to the U.S. On the second hand, we can also see that the situation with, between China and Africa has stayed actually they stay steady. We have more economic cooperation between China and Africa, and I think this is something that the Chinese uh, the government can build on and trust on the fact that the African governments are going to be supporting the development of what a country like China that has always been closer to African countries. Yeah, exactly. We'll talk about China's external trade. Uh, but last time we checked, uh, China-Africa trade grew by some 10 percent um, so far. Exactly. Uh, we're into the last month of the year. Um, Professor Liu, what are your major takeaways from this economic conference? I think the logic is very clear. First, the assessment of the general environment we are facing both at home and abroad, identify those challenges and opportunities that are uh, lying ahead. And then uh, the mean would be high quality growth through innovation drive. And the goal is to achieve the Chinese way of modernization, and in which we need a balanced and harmonized approach to a number of uh, contradicting problems. One is how to balance the supply side uh, together with the uh, driving of the consumption. The other is how to balance the environmental quality versus uh, economic growth. And then the key is what people really can get out of it. And by uh, having that, we need to boost the confidence of uh, all the business communities, be it foreign businesses, uh, state-owned ones and private ones. So confidence is something that is uh, they're very important. Therefore, we do need, first of all, to have a steady course of uh, the current economic structure and uh, uh, gradual institutional changes. But in the, in the meantime, we continue to support the uh, growth of uh, high-tech industry, and which can really lead the uh, smooth but also steady transformation for, for China to uh, reduce the uh, labor intensity and uh, resource intensity and turn into a green economy and a high value added ones. And it is a tough balance sometimes when you talk about uh, the ESG, the, the corporate responsibilities, uh, especially the environment, uh, the meeting China's dual carbon goals uh, versus ensuring a, a steady growth rate, which will mean a whole lot for the employment, for the employment of the youth and you know, for the livelihood of many sectors. Yes, absolutely. If we look at the uh, first 20 years of the Chinese reform, much was handled through deregulation. So as long as the government plays a hands-off policy and empower more of the grassroots organizations to deal with uh, economic decisions, um, we were there. So we achieved double-digit growth. But now we are facing a tough challenge of integration versus deregulation. And by integration, we have to deal with more variables and uh, address the complexities we are facing. So this requires a high uh, capacity of governance and also uh, try to really streamline the different roles of the state versus the market. And also that we are facing a lot more headwinds from the uh, global environment and in which China will have to hold a steady course uh, to be responsible uh, for the Mother Earth by uh, continued uh, or drive in green development. And in the meantime, we need to feed this 1.4 billion people with productivity. And uh, also that uh, we need to uh, hold the banner for uh, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative by providing more of the enabling environment for all partner countries. So all of which really add up to be uh, confusing, but in the meantime, it is really uh, something that uh, requires the Chinese leadership to work with the Chinese people, to work with the business community, to really to move 
on a, uh, a spearheaded way towards building the re uh, releasing, uh, resilience and achieve a uh, forging ahead. Yeah, building resilience and uh, you know um, forging this uh, institutional changes uh, that is no easy task. Uh, Andy, let's talk about the drivers of China's economy. Um, you know, we have so many uh, new normals as we speak, uh, which is part of uh, high development and new development growth that is has been. Um, publicized by the Chinese leadership. What, in your opinion, could be some of the new drivers uh, spurring the Chinese economy? Well, Wang Guan, I see that one of the important drivers, of course, is uh, t an increase in uh, high quality development, um, but especially the use of more advanced technologies applied in a more sustainable way. And here I think what's uh, a ver another important consideration that I think is often overlooked is the political element. And we cannot really separate politics from economics. And I think one uh, source of confidence and comfort for many around the world is the continuity of China's political leadership. Uh, and, of course, that means the ability to continue pursuing uh, economic policies without 180-degree shifts. But the more subtle way of understanding this as well is that this develops a lot of uh, institutional memory, uh, what some might call tacit knowledge, uh, that allows uh, China to make this transition successfully. And along the political lines, I just want to share uh, a brief excerpt from a recent Politburo meeting. Um, what uh, they said was that we must regard advancing Chinese-style modernization as the greatest political task, unite the broadest masses of people under the unified leadership of the party, focus on economic construction as the central task and high-quality development as the primary task, and step-by-step step turn the grand blueprint of Chinese-style modernization into a beautiful reality. So I think this is one of the most important drivers, is the political decision, the political continuity, that is important not just for China, but we also have to recognize that this is also showing the world, in particular the global south, an alternative path to peace and prosperity that many would argue is more just, more humane, and actually more effective. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, um, you know, um, decipher these very important things for our viewers because, you know, many of our friends in the West uh, tend to think that reading Chinese policies are like reading tea leaves. Uh, Jills, <laughs> You represent so many companies. Uh, you're based in Shanghai, yeah. um, heading this very important organization, the African Chamber of Commerce. How do the companies you represent feel about the, the business environment, uh, the doing business in China environment here uh, in this country? Well, definitely there's a difference between 2019 and 2023. Uh, we all went through um, the COVID the pandemic and uh, many, many companies faces, faced a um, huge challenge, right? And so we cannot uh, understand and see this uh, uh, environment ecosystem between China and in Africa as something that uh, has been the same before the COVID and after COVID. So now we are having a different approach. Many companies, uh, members of our chamber, have expressed the need to adjust and change the strategy when it comes to uh, getting access to the African market, when it comes to Chinese company going to Africa, uh, or getting access to the Chinese market when it comes to African companies coming to China. Uh, and uh, they have understood that the China of uh, the past is no longer the same thing. We uh, have also witnessed a dramatic change when it comes to policy regarding companies in in uh, in, in China, in Shanghai, for example. I speak from from a city. Yeah, can you be specific? And like the, specifically, how so? 
Yeah, for example, you have had many uh, companies have had challenges getting invitation letters, right? If you want to have your African partners to come and visit you uh, for a business visit, uh, you have a very difficult um, policy when it comes to uh, having visa. Uh, you have you kind of see some kind of double standard because at the same time you have European countries having. Uh, uh, um, visa-free access to China, but African businesses having challenges coming to uh, to China. You have many companies that have cancelled their travel to China because of visa visa policies, uh, and this has changed. Uh, before COVID-19, it was more open. Now, yes, the challenge has made it very difficult for. African business people and African companies to work closely with China. So we are working toward the idea of trying to change it and try to find a, a, let's say a smoother way to make China attractive again, to make China that China that used to be very competitive when it comes to the African market. So, uh, so uh, to work with the Chinese government also to implement this kind of positive policies that will attract better investment from, from Africa. Because uh, I'll just find a final word, we have um, received many um, requests from African businessmen uh, trying to understand how it could be suitable for them to invest in China because they don't have... Um, like most European countries, it has uh, access to the Chinese in very lucrative investment markets. So working uh, with uh, the Chinese policies, um, uh, authorities in China, and also with African government, we plan on having something to kind of uh, tap into this new innovative market that China has become. Yeah, thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, these very important questions. I think. Uh, Many of those who are watching our programs are from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the State Administration of Immigration. And uh, I think um, fair to say that they have been very responsive to concerns of our friends from around the world. And um, thank you for flagging all those issues uh, on, behalf of those, um, on behalf of those African companies. Um, Professor Liu, talking about uh, industrial growth, um, a major gauge of industrial activities say that uh, there has been a moderate expansion especially when it comes to the green energy sectors, the production of output of renewable energy products experienced particularly strong growth. Solar energy batteries grew 63% year on year. EV charging piles grew 34%. A new vehicle, new energy vehicle grew 26% year on year. Um, those are uh, actually the, the silver linings of the Chinese economy. Yes, uh, the, uh, definitely the green energy part is really uh, a major driver for Chinese continued growth and also is really pointing to the future. And, uh, but in the meantime, the, uh, I think the government uh, work report also uh, points out a very important uh, notion, uh, the es establish before you dismantle, which means that uh, we are not really doing a complete uh, dramatic frog leap into those new arena, although they are uh, the ideal, they still need a further consolidation. For example, uh, we still rely heavily on the coal burning for uh, power generation, more than 50%. And uh, before, uh, the uh, entire power uh, of the new energy, be it solar, wind, uh, et cetera, they can really sustain a uh, lion's share of the Chinese uh, power market. Uh, we still have to uh, make a very de delicate balance, although the direction is very clear. And uh, the other is that uh, more of the knowledge content uh, combined with the digital uh, transformation is uh, being unfolding the uh, power of productivity. So uh, in the meantime, we also see that uh, the challenges we need, uh, we are having displacement of some the low end workforces and uh, more of the uh, supply chain is being shifted and low-end production is uh, being reallocated to uh, Vietnam, to Cambodia, to Myanmar, etc. So uh, during this uh, important transitional period, the key is uh, stability and also capacity building. Uh, for example, those who handle more of the manual work, how they can be trained to get engaged into the mechanical and uh, digital uh, operation. 
And so this is really the responsible of the Chinese government. And the other is that uh, how we can really give the uh, better enabling environment for businesses to work together, particularly in terms of level playing fields. So uh, right now, I think our African friend has really pointed out a very important issue. The long tail effect of uh, COVID management is still being felt. Uh, because we do need higher level of transparency and consistency in our uh, policy towards all businesses, and, you know, be it from Africa, from European Union, from uh, the United States, and also from our home. Yeah, but for sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Our African friends are very important uh, trading partners. Uh, actually, last time we checked, uh, the BRI countries uh, and their trade with China constitutes something like 46% of China's entire external trade uh, in the year past. Uh, very important trading partners. Andy, um, Professor Liu just talked about a very important issue that is productivity gain. At the end of the day, it's about uh, costing uh, less, uh, using less energy and resources to produce the same amount of uh, output. Um, what are some of the things that you, you see as potentially uh, uplifting China's productivity going forward? No, that's such an important question, Wang Guan. And I think this is also another dimension of the hard truth uh, of high quality developments uh, in the new era, in that uh, it cannot be just growth for growth's sake uh, without considering the impact um, on the environment. And one of the most important areas I see here that China is emphasizing uh, is the use of AI. So I'll give you an example. Companies like Google, like Amazon, like Huawei, like Alibaba are in the data center business providing cloud computing. And energy costs, especially cooling costs, are a very large component of these expenses. So Google recently implemented something they call Deep Cool, which is based on DeepMind, uh, their AI company, uh, that reduced total energy costs in their data centers by 15%. And this is a company that hires some of the most talented, experienced data center professionals uh, in the world. And they're lucky to reduce expenses by a couple of percent. So I think this shows uh, the potential when you have a state-led uh, approach to the implementation of artificial intelligence, not just for consumer applications, but for these largely invisible, uh, but still vitally important uh, applications like uh, the use of energy in data centers. So I think this is one very, very important area to keep an eye on, in addition to solar panels, uh, electric vehicles, batteries, uh, et cetera, that I think Professor Liu did such a great job of, of uh, explaining. Yeah, Andy, another very important question that is foreign investment. Some foreign companies, let's face it, uh, left China. Uh, many others chose to uh, stay in China. Uh, what can China do differently um, or even better to attract more foreign investors and to retain more foreign investors? Well, I think China's done a very, very good job of creating a positive environment for foreign business here. Um, certainly, uh, there's areas for improvement. Now, one thing that is unfortunate uh, is the, uh, I think, unjustified negative media coverage that creates this narrative that foreign businesses are abandoning China for various reasons, changes in policy, change in sentiment. Um, one area I think that the media is correct, though, is that uh, some of this is due to American pressure, unfortunately, that's making it difficult for even American businesses uh, to operate in China. Uh, so certainly there could be some diplomatic progress to make that better. Uh, I think what China is doing uh, with this Invest in China brand uh, certainly helps. Um, you know, and I can't help but think of uh, what uh, Joe Nye, who's the uh, China chairman for McKinsey, said, that uh, the next China is China um, because there's still enormous untapped uh, consumer potential here. Uh, Professor Liu talked about integration, so that is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, if China can make uh, manufacturing, distribution, and consumption uh, more streamlined, more closely integrated, 
uh, that's not just a big benefit for Chinese businesses, but foreign businesses as well. And it's not just those in the consumer sector, uh, but all along the value chain. So uh, I think Wang Guan, uh, some of this is overblown, uh, that uh, there's a negative uh, environment for investing in China. Um, but at the same time, uh, there are certainly PR things, I think, that can be done better. And uh, continuing with the integration uh, that Professor Liu mentioned certainly will be more attractive for foreign investors. Yeah, true story, true story. Jills, um, do you want to respond to what Andy has just said? Uh, Andy made a good point. I, I, I think it's important for the Chinese government to improve, uh, uh, I, will, I will use a more subtle word, the soft power when it comes to attracting uh, new companies. The, the company that used to work uh, with China for over decades, especially from African, from the African side, they have not changed. Uh, uh, from, from my knowledge, I've, not, I've never heard a company say, uh, because of the COVID, I'm going to stop working with China. Uh, but uh, there are new companies that have never worked with China. They are the one uh, uh, exploring let's say, different opportunities, or they want to try Turkey, they want to try uh, Vietnam, they want to try Cambodia, uh, and they are kind of comparing China with these countries. And, and our job and our position is to try to explain to these uh, uh, companies that China offers something that you won't find anywhere else, a combination of all the production um, factors. You have uh, educated uh, skilled laborers. You have uh, infrastructure and logistic. That is, uh, there is no way to compare the Chinese level of infrastructure and logistics when it comes to this kind of business. So, and we just want the Chinese government to be more, let's say, um, more straightforward when it comes to facilitating the African business to come doing business with China. Uh, that's why in the previous uh, discussion, I was talking about the, the, the visa policies to make sure that China, African companies can come and explore the African market, see the potentialities, what is new. Uh, uh, one last thing, uh, um, you know, Africa is still a growing uh, market when it comes to going to the industrialization of the continent. We are moving from a phase where we used to be only importers to a phase where we want to become industrial com uh, continent. In this way, we need the support of Chinese factories. We need the support uh, of the Chinese industries. But we cannot have that support if you don't have uh, easy access to these solution, to these factories, to these manufacturing solutions. So this is something that we are working hard and pushing African government as well as Chinese government to implement the solution that will make it easier for these new business people to have access to the Chinese knowledge when it comes to manufacturing industries and uh, technologies. Uh, very quickly, Professor Liu, did the Western analysts got it right when they, when they talk about the attractiveness of the Chinese market? Well, uh, I cannot really generalize the Western thinkers in that way, but uh, uh, through my last two uh, weeks of visits in the United States, the general impression is that, okay, China has a legitimate uh, need to strengthen its national security uh, versus the national efficiency. But uh, uh, what is really required by the international business community is that uh, we need a high level of clarity, uh, for example, in dealing with national security, information control, espionage law, etc. So. Uh, you know, whereas uh, more of the ambiguity and there's going to be uh, a sort of a chill effect among all the uh, stakeholders involved. So uh, I think now uh, all the relevant ministries are working out a number of uh, guidelines and procedures to streamline uh, the interpretation of those laws. Uh, for example, what is really the uh, institutional uh, opening and what is really the national security. Yeah, more explaining um, is uh, required, obviously. Thank you very much, Professor Liu. Andy, thank you. And Jills, thank you very much. That will do it for this edition of The Hub. Thank you for watching.